Hey everyone, welcome back. So, here we are after the last video, uh, the roughing, roughing pass on the uh, spherical mirror is complete. Um, I say roughing, and what I mean by that is I did a finishing pass on here in that, you know, I did a 20 millionth depth of cut uh, with a extremely slow, you know, micron or so feed per rev. I did a finishing pass, but it's still a roughing because I've not measured this yet. I don't know how my X offset is set. It was actually done by uh, by eye, uh, just using a microscope and visually centering the tool about the axis of the spindle. Uh, and you know, it looks all, it looks all right. I'm kind of I'm kind of a fan of how it looks. These get these nice little mounting flanges here look pretty. Um, and it's, you know, it's doing the thing. You can see the magnification there. Certainly concave. Uh, but when I shine it at the light, you can see all the problems that arise. Not so nice looking anymore. Um, the main thing to note is this ring here in the middle. And I'm still trying to figure out what exactly caused that. But what I observed is when it was doing its finishing pass, it was looking fine, cutting, and then all of a sudden it, boop, jumped in a lot like definitely way more than 20 millionths and it moved in and then sort of continued taking what looked to be about that much for the rest of the pass. So investigating what caused that, but that's sort of the major defect. Besides that, you can still see all of the issues I've highlighted before, like in the uh, air bearing vibration video where there's just that haziness and that's just poor surface, surface roughness caused by that tool sort of shaking, uh, you know, around 25 nanometers or so one micro inch. So a couple other patches of crappiness where chips got caught and um, had a brief failure of the mist cooling, but otherwise not too bad. Um, certainly good enough for a first pass. So what this video is about is how do we measure this now? We've turned a mirror, but we need to know how good it is. Surface roughness is one thing. We typically use AFM for that. We can use white light interferometry if we have it. Uh, we don't. But we've done pretty extensive characterization of the surface roughness before, so we know what that's a, you know approximately going to be for this mirror. What we care about and what the whole this whole project's about is the form. How accurate is that spherical shape across the whole aperture of the mirror, and is it going to be good enough to see something with? So let's look at the uh, tool that I use to do this. Uh, it's a bath interferometer. I won't go into too much detail about it. Um, there's a lot of literature on the internet already about it, including a lot of really good YouTube videos. Um, but I'll sort of show the, the setup and then we can look at the results that we got. Okay, so this is the bath interferometer that I made. Uh, just real quick, looked it, up, looked it up one night out of some optics we had lying around. You know, beam splitter, laser diode, Diverging lens and mirror. I won't go into too much detail on the uh, uh, optical side of things here. There's a bunch of great videos explaining how these guys work. Um, check out the YouTube channel Bath Interferometers if you're interested. But yeah, I just made that, mounted it on a little XYZ stage from a probe tester. Here it's pointed at uh, the mirror we're testing down there. That's not diamond turned, that's just another telescope mirror I have lying around. Um, yep, here you can see the, the test beam and the reference beam uh, coming out from the front, and then on the rear side of it, we get our interferer beam. Uh, that's gonna be kinda hard to see, so I'll set up a DSLR here. And there we are, there's, uh, there's the view uh, out the back. So right now I've got it uh, nice and focused, and I'm gonna start to add some uh, decenter here to get those tilt fringes you see. Now these are, all right, I mean, you can see fringes, but certainly not really nice looking. Um, but watch what happens when we insert a polarizing filter in front of the camera. Uh, all of a sudden, you get these crazy awesome contrast fringes. Uh, like this is, you know, if you're a machinist and you've tried to, you know, get fringes with an optical flap before, um, you can appreciate how how stunning that these are to, to look at. Uh, the polarization that the beam splitter uh, produces means that you can get really crisp 
fringes if you use the, the polarizing filter on the back end in front of the camera. And yeah, this is this is basically the setup. Um, really easy to use, awesome instrument. Uh, definitely would recommend checking them out. Uh, but let's take a look at how we did. All right, so now that we've you know had a look at some really nice interferograms like this and seen what the bath interferometer is capable of, let's take a look at what the results from our mirror turned out like. Not so nice. This is the interferogram I was able to obtain, um, the best that I was able to obtain. Uh, it's, as you can see, not super great, uh, and we've got a lot of really wacky stuff going on, but right off the bat, the main thing is the waviness. This sort of mid-spatial frequency, these ripples along the fringes, um, that's sort of the predominant uh, error that I see here. There's obviously you know, with all the form error and, and everything, but the main thing is the uh, the waviness is pretty non-ideal, uh, but not an ideal interferogram. Luckily, good enough for DFT fringe uh, to be able to discern some information about it. So here's the results, and honestly. Not great, but better than I was expecting for a first go and a visual, a completely visual um, tool offset setting. So down here on the bottom, I have the plot set up where we're looking at the surface error, uh, not the wavefront error, but the surface error, which is half of the wavefront error. So this is this is a readout in nanometers of um, across you know some different traces, sixteen lines. Uh, across it, um, how far out the shape is from a perfect sphere. And you can see it's, you know, plus or minus around 200 nanometers. Um, which is, if we just look at that in a vacuum, really impressive. Uh, and it's important to continue to do that because if we look at this as, you know, an optic and the quality as an optic, it's obviously garbage. Um, but just to keep myself sane, I have to, you know, remind myself, well, we've machined this part and the profile across this whole 70 millimeter aperture is accurate to, you know, this degree. So that's pretty cool. But uh, this lets us see, you know, in better detail what exactly is going on uh, with the part. Now, the, you'll see a large astigmatism up here in this wavefront error plot. Uh, and I'm not really sure where that came from or what's causing that. Um, still sort of a mystery, but open to ideas on that one. Uh, if I turn off the astigmatism here, just to make it a little easier to see the rest of the errors, uh, we get this. And what this, what how I'm choosing to interpret this um, is I think my tool path was offset a little too far towards center, meaning when I set my X offset, the uh, tool was uh, past center um, instead of at zero. I've, let me, I'll put up like a sketch or something to sort of show what I mean by this. It's really hard to describe with words. Um, but if the tool path was offset past center, uh, then we would expect the outer area here to be high or higher than it was supposed to be. Um, and you'd expect the whole tool path to be, you know, sort of higher than it's supposed to be, but it would taper off towards the center. Now, as for what's going on in the center here, this is that ring that you can see, or you saw earlier, um, the really visible ring. That's the sharp drop off here. So what I thought was a random plunge into the, into the material because of some, you know, software glitch or something, it looks like what actually was happening there is it was building up some error for a while and then all of a sudden it basically snapped back uh, to uh, a deeper position and then why, as far as why it tapers off towards the center here, I think that's just because the surface speed was reducing and as it got closer there was just more tool pressure and it got pushed out a little more. This is all, you know, just me guessing based off of the, you know, the tea leaves here. But that's how I'm, I'm going to 
call this one. So certainly not great, uh, but cert, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not too upset about this as a first result. Um, what I'm going to do next is actually have at it uh, again for another pass with this mirror. Um, set the tool offset more accurately by doing a groove and measure test, which I'll show off in the next video. The other thing I considered doing was instead of doing a spherical mirror, uh, actually making it a parabolic uh, profile. And just out of curiosity, I checked what the difference between those two, you know, profiles would be as far as, you know, like how, if I just ran a parabolizing pass over it, you know, how big of a cut would that be taking for most of it? Uh, and it turns out the maximum difference between a sphere and a parabola of this focal length uh, and at this aperture is around 10 millionths of an inch or a quarter micron or so, or a half a wave, you know, however you want to phrase it. So if I zoom way in here, you can see this is the difference. It's the difference between the uh, the blue and the red traces here. Very, very tiny amount. Um, so I don't know if it's really going to be worth it optically. A quarter wave difference. I'm sure, you know, well, I've got bigger problems is really the, the essence of it. Um, but it's crazy how, you know, on these scales for an F6 mirror at 2.75 inches in diameter, the difference really is that small. The other thing that I checked out of curiosity was, you know, let's say the error we saw before um, that raised area on the outside rim here was truly just a consequence of me having my offset set wrong. Um, that was about 100 nanometers or so high. So I said, if I wanted to see a difference here of 100 nanometers, uh, between the ideal shape and the um, the shape that we actually cut, how far would a circular profile have to be shifted uh, to the left in this particular picture in order to to result in in that difference? And it turns out it's about a tenth or a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. So I think visually, again, we're sort of making some assumptions about the correctness of the interferogram data. But if that is really the, if that really is accurate, then I'm going to say that I had my X offset set to within about a tenth. And in order for me to reduce that error down to, you know, maybe 25 nanometers or so, I'm going to need to do a little better. So that's what the process is for the next video that I'll show off. Um, trying to zero that to a slightly more accurate degree. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Uh, hope you guys found this one interesting, and I'll see you next time.